People taking responsibility for their own recovery. We offer tools. We, we talk about four points, which we'll cover in a moment, but it really is about the individual finding what works for them. Because of that, and this is a theme I'll come back to several times, while SMART can be a great standalone program or primary pathway to recovery, we also really work great as a complementary pathway to recovery. It's not about having to follow a complete program. It's about a set of tools and finding what works for you as somebody in recovery. Um, so the homes we work with, um, many of them uh, have a strong basis in 12 steps. Some are faith-based. We really find that we can have great, um, you know, great cooperation and great learning in all of those environments. Um, SMART is evidence-based. It's based on rational emot emotive behavior therapy. I uh, was very excited that my new friend Cindy told me at the beginning that she actually went to the Albert Ellis Institute for training, which is um, sort of the, Albert Ellis is the, uh, the progenitor of uh, rational emotive behavior therapy. So um, we very much follow that legacy. It is abstinence-oriented. And the reason we use the term abstinence-oriented rather than abstinence-based is we are compatible with MAT. Not to say that MAT is a requirement of SMART by any means, um, you know, just that we are open to it. And it's something that people in SMART uh, you know, do sometimes use as an option. And as I mentioned, I think I got ahead of myself, it's both, it can be both an alternative or a complementary um, path to recovery. 
Okay, so I had mentioned the four points. Let's talk about what those are quickly. Um, these are not really steps because they are, um, they sort of all work together. It's not something that's just a, um, a set timeline, but it does give a basis for the tools we cover. So the first is building and maintaining motivation to change. Obviously, this has a strong context in recovery, you know, changing behaviors, um, changing our relationships with substances but also can be used for any number of things we want to change in life. Um, I, like many of us, am working on exercising more right now and I'm using a lot of the building and maintaining motivation tools to get myself doing it more consistently. Uh, the other tool I'm using is my friend Jonna from Fletcher over here checks in with me regularly to make sure that I'm, uh, I'm using my rowing machine at home. So uh, I've got a great accountability check. Um, the second is coping with urges. Um, you know, this fairly straightforward. It's a variety of tools that we might use um, when we're experiencing urges or cravings. We use both terms um, to delay, distract, um, attack the urge, uh, any number of approaches. The third, and this is really the core of rational emotive ther therapy, rational emotive behavior therapy, pardon me, is managing thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So when we confront problems, whether they're directly substance-based or whether they are other life problems in smart recovery, we really think about it in terms of our thoughts affect our feelings and lead to our behaviors. So we generally find when facing those challenges, if we can take it back to the level of what was I thinking and then what emotions did I have in response to those thoughts it gives us a stronger platform to then look at those behaviors and decide how, if we can replace those negative thoughts with more positive ones, how we might therefore lead to more positive emotion and ultimately behaviors that are in our better interest um, in terms of living our lives. And then the final related to living our lives is lifestyle balance. Um, now look, Lifestyle balance isn't a perfect thing, I don't think, for any of us. I certainly haven't achieved it completely. Um, I often actually frame this one as living a more balanced lifestyle. Um, and this is ultimately taking those first three points and getting to a point where we feel like we are living our recovery, still working it certainly, but where it doesn't feel like as much work, where it feels like just part of our lived experience. Um, so the SMART program in general is built around this as is the Successful Life Skills Program, which we'll be talking about a little bit more. Okay, so Successful Life Skills. This is a workbook. It's based on that self-empowering approach, using the four points as a framework. But what is really key to Successful Life Skills is that it is designed for people in times of transition, often transitional environments, it actually was originally used under the name Inside Out in prisons and then was modified over time to work in other transitional environments, such as residential housing. And so while it uses the SMART concepts, it also gets more specific into, as the title would suggest, life skills issues. Um, so, come on, clicker. <laughs> so some of those things we, might, we, might, we cover in successful life skills. Um, two of our real focus points for the program that kind of continue over um, the 12 sessions are locus of control. I often kind of jokingly say locus of control is the, the smart or REBT version of the serenity prayer. It's about looking at those things that we can control, those things that maybe are beyond our control, and how we guide a path informed by that. The second and a newer concept, not original to SMART, but, um, but one we find very important is recovery capital. We find, especially in working with people in transitional environments, that looking at what resources they have to aid them in their recovery, that can be everything from physical resources, you know, that, um, hey, I have a driver's license. I don't have a car, but I have a driver's license, and that's a good start, to much more emotional things that, okay, I have a group that I check in with accountability. I have a peer support group that I attend every Tuesday night. Um, and then, you know, do I have family supports? If not, are there ways that I can mimic family supports within my community? So really getting into both the practical and the emotional end of recovery on that, um, but in successful life skills as compared to the SMART handbook, even more of a focus on the practical. 
Um, we talked about one of the, the maybe my favorite of the uh, four points of SMART is the managing uh, thoughts, feelings, and behavior. So I threw that in here too, because I think it's, uh, it's so core. But then we get into some specifics of like, okay, so if we're in recovery housing or we're working towards that greater independence, how do we handle stress? How do we handle the little daily challenges that come up? You know, oh, my cell phone bill was $15 more than I expected this month. Um, you know, how do I account for that? What do I do? Um, you know, my brother's normally great support for me, but uh, he's driving me a little nuts right now. I have a brother. He drives me a little nuts sometimes. So that one is pulled from personal experience, y'all. Um, and then things like job skills, financial management concepts, um, personal budgeting. We, we look at all these things with the ultimate goal of achieving greater lifestyle balance. That's really what we're looking to do here. So that as the people that, that you know, take this course and that work with successful life skills, head toward those more independent stages. And I like to use the phrase more independent because we recognize that in recovery housing environments that often there are kind of a series of steps. You know, it's not as simple as just hey, today I'm a resident and tomorrow I'm completely independent. We know that the residents we work with are often you know, taking steps towards that goal, maybe getting a job, um, maybe getting more independent in terms of transportation or a little bit more allowance of when they can be out in the community. <clears throat> Sorry, y'all. Okay, I meant to preview this at the beginning, but now I'm gonna ask for something. Do I have a bold volunteer in the audience who would be up for, for talking about a change that either they are pondering in their life now, it could also be just an example, maybe one you've already made, but you're interested in looking at it in the, uh, through a new lens. Anybody feeling particularly brave today? All right, I appreciate it. <laughs> And what's your name? Debbie. Debbie, thank you so much. So what is the change that you were considering making, Debbie? So I want to do more um, lightweight lifting. Lightweight lifting. Okay, I like it. Got Mike flexing over here in the corner for you. <laughs> um, so, so great goal there. And so I didn't even tell you all the beginning. This is called the change plan worksheet. It's one of the tools we use. And I just love showing a tool, A, because I'm a facilitator at heart. So this is the thing I love doing every week is, uh, you know, getting out there and talking about these tools. But B, because I think it gives you some feel for the book, for, for the book and the program. So Debbie, how important is this change? And I always caution people on this step. Many of us, myself included, have a I won't say bad tendency, but a tendency to make everything in their life a 10 or a one. So we try to look for more nuance than that. So where does that light weightlifting fall on your list of priorities? Um, it's probably a seven. Seven. I love a seven. That's often a good stage where we have that motivation to make change. It doesn't feel, though, all encompassing or that if we don't make this change, it's a huge failure. But it gives us uh, a good platform to work from. Now the one that is always the trickiest to me. How confident on a scale of one to 10 am I that I can make this change? I'm a three. A three, okay, okay. So it sounds like we have some bolstering to do here to see if we can, uh, if we can help you to that point. Very honest, I very much appreciate that. Okay, so let's get into the, um, uh, the elements of the change. What is the most important reasons, or what is the, the single most important or group of important reasons uh, for this change? Um, I lost a bunch of weight, and I did it through swimming, which gave me a different type of strength. But now I find that as I'm more active with my kayak and walking and hiking, I'm not as strong as I want to be in some way. So I want to get to the next level of activity, so I know in my head it's Boy, that, that is fantastic because it sounds like we have a strong base of change that we're already working from, that you've really done some terrific things. You've proven to yourself that you can do things in the area of physical activity a lot more than I'm currently doing. So I'm a little jealous of that, Debbie. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, it sounds, it, it sounds like you, you've really, um, you know, you've really kind of set a good framework for yourself to work from. 
So what are the steps that you would need to take to make this change? I need somebody like him in my life. <laughs> <laughs> You see, the funny thing is, you, you, you think you need Mike, but you really need Jonna because she's the one who's uh, dog it and will stay on your case. But you could probably use both of them. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, so, so that's a great one. And often I like to dig in here on steps to change. Is scheduling an issue? Is it something that you'd have to make time for? Gotcha. Kind of, kind of carve out that you know my my Wednesdays and Fridays from one to one to three are for this. Um, often an important one to look at because, um, again, I like to use I statements so I can tell y'all I sometimes decide, hey, this is the change I want to make, and then I look at my calendar and I go, okay, where is this going to fit? You know, <laughs> I've done it with my rowing machine recently, where it's like I've got to get on it at six in the morning, or it's not going to happen for the rest of the day. Um, so. Good identification of some steps. Now, here's where it really gets interesting to me, is how can other people help me in this? Now, actually, in the steps, you already gave us a starting point that we'll get you Mike's number, and he can be... Uh... <laughs> but, but how can other people in your life help you out with this? <laughs> um, I probably just make eye contact and <laughs> yeah, and, and often what I look at here is accountability is terrific. Also trying to structure accountability for myself in a way that's not going to feel overly obtrusive because I, I can be a, a stubborn uh a stubborn guy sometimes. And, um, you know, if I feel like somebody's too much on my case, that can be difficult. I won't make it all about me though. So, but that's something you could think about whether you have answers now or not is like who in your life just feels more like a coach or a good or just opposed to, you know, a taskmaster. Um, because that often helps a lot in that, um, who can help you in accountability step. All right. And then one thing that I think, and I'm just checking my time y'all to make sure I don't run too long. Um, one thing I think we often overlook when planning, how are we going to define or know when our plan is working for us? For me, like when it's actually happening like three times a week. There you go. Great benchmark there. Um, are there things beyond the benchmarking? Like you mentioned that you want to do it to build strength. Are there ways to kind of be aware of that change as well? I like it. I'm going to have to take your word because I live like in the bayous in Louisiana where we have no elevation. So everything's just like out right out the door or not. But uh, I will take your word on it that the uh, the impact that could be an issue. Um, but but I, but I really like that because often it's good to pair scheduled type events or things that we can look at very didactically with those things that are more quality of life. So we also have that feel and that check on ourselves how it's working. Also, often that's an opportunity for us to take a lot of pride in what we're doing, because it's like, hey, this isn't just about meeting the schedule. This is about me feeling better with an activity that I already love. So um, really like that. Um, and that's basically it. That's the change plan worksheet is looking at, you know, there's nothing magical here, but it's a kind of systematic way to look at that change so that we're not just saying, hey, I want to do this and then either I do it or not. It's something to come up with at the beginning. And I will tell you, it's something that I use for work decisions. Um, I, uh, my wife is very fond of it for me because like when she assigns me a chore in the house, she can, uh, <laughs> don't get me wrong, she's a sweetheart, but she can point at it and say like, hey, you said you were seven on confidence of uh, getting this done. Where are we at? It's like, <laughs> and then my cop out is I readjust it to a five and say, okay, I wasn't as confident as I thought I was. So we've talked a little bit about SMART and a little bit about successful life skills. 
But let's get to the meat of it and talk about what this initiative is that we're working on with Fletcher. So first of all, important to know, this is a fully uh, funded federal grant from HRSA. So uh, there is no cost at all to homes. In fact, and we'll talk about this at the end, there is a small stipend provided for homes that participate. It uses SMART Successful Life Skills Handbook. Boy, we've talked about that three times already, huh? <laughs> but the way we use that is a 12-session program led by a SMART facilitator. Mike's actually uh, led some of our programs, and he was just asking me today if uh, he can do more. I'm currently doing two, um, including with, uh, with Jay over here. Um, and it is very rewarding work for us. In addition to the 12 session program, which goes through the entire life skills book, by the way, I forgot to say, we often conduct those via Zoom. If we have a facilitator near your home that's available you know, at the time that you need them, we can do in person as well as a possibility. Um, along with those 12 sessions for your residents, we also provide smart facilitator training for up to two people on your staff. Um, the reason for that, we'd love for you to be able to continue with this, whether continue with successful life skills or standard smart meetings. I will also tell you, I think these, I'm biased, let me, let me admit that check, but I think the facilitator training is a terrific thing just for learning to work with people in recovery, even if you never run a smart meeting. It gives you some of this grounding and rational emotive behavior therapy. We talk a lot about motivational interviewing, which we just did a little of over here. Um, and it really can help uh, just, you know, I, I think everybody in this room probably has uh, some amazing recovery tools, but it can help supplement that and add to your tool chest a little bit. Um, again, provided at no cost. I like to highlight that a couple of times. Um, and then finally, we are, and we have, we have Robin here who works on this part, it, part of it. There is also a survey portion to the program where both the home and the residents fill out surveys at the beginning, midway, and end of the program. That is actually the portion that the stipend is tied to. The reason we're funded is for research purposes. Of course, we want to do great outreach and great work as part of uh, that research getting done. Um, and that, I should say as well, is everything is completely anonymous. Robin can give you more information on that if you need it. You're like, oh, I'm putting you on the spot there. Um, but, and also important to say, and we, we love everybody to participate, residents can opt out of that if they're not comfortable with the survey portion, and that doesn't affect um, your involvement in the program at all. And then finally, for participating homes, again, based on that survey portion, um, we provide a $1,200 stipend. I say we very liberally. Fletcher provides the $1,200 stipend. Uh, I don't really have anything to do with that part, but you know, I like to claim some credit for it. And y'all, that is uh, really what I have today. So I think we have at least a couple minutes left here. Oh, wow. Okay. I left us more time than I usually do, Jama. Okay. So where are we kicking off? Anybody in person have any questions? Yes. Um, so I will speak from my own experience on that. I discovered SMART right at the beginning of my discover, right in the beginning of my recovery. I sometimes use the word rediscovery too. So I kind of got uh, caught up there. Um, and for me, it was very effective right away. Great call out on CBT, by the way. REBT and CBT are so close to the same that, uh, you know, we tend to say REBT because it's the explicit, but, but really it is very, very similar to CBT principles. So I think it can work right away. I also, and one of the reason we, reasons we talk about personal pathways to recovery and that it can be complementary is, well, I'll, I'll tell you a quick aside. What I tell my, my classes at the beginning is if you get three tools from this program that are things you use in recovery on an ongoing basis, I think that's a huge victory. So not everybody in the room has to grab every tool and say, hey, I'm doing that you know, every week for the rest of my life. It's often kind of that picking and choosing what works for them and um, what can supplement their recovery. So I hope that's an answer. <laughs> Do we have anything online? Yeah, I think that, I think that we're going to alternate, but I, not yet. Okay. Okay. I think you had a question. So that is actually called Inside Out. 
it is the basis of the successful life skills book. So it is very, very similar. Um, I'd be happy to get you some more information on that as well. By the way, I should plug quickly that not only us, but some other great programs are in the little room right across the hall over there. There's a smart uh, stand up outside. So please, please come by and see us and we can help with uh, filling in some of that stuff, sending additional information and getting you in touch with uh, the people that know that best. What do we got, Robin? Okay, so um, uh, SMART has several different, uh, the, the core uh, book of SMART is the SMART handbook. And that's not really a curriculum per se, that is a rundown of all the SMART tools taken in the order of those four points. The ones that would fall more under, uh, is curriculi the right, uh, right plural? I'm not really sure, but that are, uh, <laughs> that would fall under the, the umbrella of curriculum are successful life skills, the Inside Out program, and what Mike was just educating me about a little more today, our teen and youth program as well, um, which are very similar to the um, successful life skills, but aimed at a younger audience, obviously. Mike, anything I'm missing there? Oh, thank you. Family and friends as well is um, something that can be done as its own training um, after doing facilitator training or ancillary to facilitator training. I'll also throw in that the free training we offer as part of this program includes that friends and family at your op family and friends at your option. All right, any other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, I, I see that the field with somebody who's already signed up back here. So <laughs> Great question. So one thing that we really train our facilitators who are doing SLS with, and I actually run those trainings, is to work closely with the houses that they, they are you know, running to see if there are any tripping points, anything that runners, runs counter to, philosophy, to the philosophy. I will tell you there is, to my knowledge, one four-letter word in the Successful Life Skills book, and a house I'm working with just asked me, hey, can we just kind of scratch that out in ours and not, uh, not say that, which we totally respect. But also on points like, um, you know, like empowered versus powerlessness. One of the things I've talked about in my house, I, houses, I don't think those concepts are as opposite as they sound, you know, when you just use those words. So one thing we, we can address is when we look at empowered, we are talking about you being able to make changes through whatever means work for you. So if part of the way that works for you is through a higher power or another concept, that is awesome. We are going to talk about how we can help empower you in your part of making those changes. But again, we also can address that on a house by house basis. So if there's topics that it, we'd rather just kind of slide through, um, we can even have them X out a section of the book if we think it doesn't apply as much. All right, are we uh, one more question? Great, great. In the back. Um, so the facilitator training is available online. Like John, I just said, though, please, please come see us in the other room. We will be happy to provide you some information and make sure we uh, get you headed in the right direction. And Mike, you had something to throw in? Okay, thank you all very much. And I'm going to pass this back over to Melina to introduce Nate, which I guess I just uh, kind of jumped ahead on. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, we also included some information in the chat for the online audience on how to connect further and for further information. I am going to introduce Dr. Ledgerwood, who's going to talk to us about contingency management. We have two studies going on with contingency management, and he'll talk about his today. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. 
How's everyone doing after lunch? So it looked like a really amazing lunch. Um, you get to follow Brad, who is really engaging. So don't fall asleep on me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, we're just getting started here. Just, just give us a minute to get the slides up. And maybe while Milena's doing that, um, just want to thank the Fletcher Group and Milena and everyone else for inviting me to talk about our new project that we're doing as a, an additional project related to this uh, the HRSA grant that uh, Brad was just talking about. And the focus of this intervention grant uh, project, rather pilot project, is on uh, contingency management or motivational incentives. Has anyone ever heard of that? type of intervention before, just by show of hands. Okay. So I, I tend to use the terminology contingency management because I've been doing this work since the late 90s. So I've been actually doing contingency management work since I was a graduate student. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist. So I was doing my PhD in uh, Detroit, Michigan. And uh, my first experience doing this work was with teenagers who wanted to quit smoking cigarettes. So it was actually a really cool way to get into it. And I was sort of, uh, you know, really interested in how this intervention works and made it a big part of my, my career. Um, I'm a professor in psychiatry at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. And my work over the last 25 years has involved um, developing and testing uh, different types of behavioral treatments for substance use problems for people who want to quit smoking cigarettes for people with gambling problems so i've sort of covered a lot of a lot of different ground uh which i think is sort of you know <laughs> not always typical i think if we just hit the sometimes well, it's showing partial, like, on oh the i see oh wow yeah. okay <laughs> i'll just stay out of the way and uh, <laughs> let the experts do this because these guys will get it figured out Where's Wayne State? Wayne State is in Detroit, Michigan. So, um, oh, we got, or is this a, okay. So they can, they can see it on there. Are you guys okay with this? Uh, even though it's the, actually the presenter uh, slides that all right with you guys. <laughs> or Melina can try it again. So we'll see if it. Works. Sometimes you just got to turn it off and turn it back on or unplug it and then re don't unplug it because that will be a problem. Oh, look, that's looking good here. Is it looking good online? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Technology is not my. You know. <laughs> okay, great. So um, I always have way too many slides. So it, in some cases, you might see that I'm going to kind of zip through one or two slides here. But I do want to just at least give you the objectives for sort of what we're, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, our focus is on this, this new pilot project, um, implementing contingency management interventions in recovery housing. So before I go too far, how many of you uh, work in recovery housing? Okay, so a lot of you. So if any of you after this presentation have an interest in learning more about becoming involved in this project, which is fairly close to the beginning uh, beginning phases, we've uh, we've gotten a number of uh, houses interested in a number of different states across the United States, um, and uh, we'd love to include a few more. So if you're interested, let us know. I'm going to provide you a little bit of an overview of what contingency management is, and also talk about some of the ways we've actually implemented it over the years and some of the research that we've actually published. I like to think of contingency management as um, one, of the, one of the interventions for substance use disorders that has like the most evidence for its effectiveness and efficacy that oftentimes many people have never heard of. I think that that's changing now. If I had asked this audience maybe 10 or 15 years ago, have you ever heard of contingency management? Most people would probably have said, no, I've never never heard of that. But we're starting to actually see that it's it's being implemented with more frequency in, in larger sort of uh, um, areas, larger organizations and so forth. But we'll sort of talk about what what is involved here. So. First off, let's just talk about barriers to uh, substance use disorder care very briefly in rural settings. You guys are probably much more familiar than even I, than I am on a lot of these things, but um, 
obviously, you know, we have transportation uh, barriers. A lot of people don't have vehicles. There's not a lot of public transit. Um, there, you know, it's a lot farther between uh, treatment providers. There have been actually quite a few presentations I've, I've see, seen today that have sort of focused on that. <laughs> Often there's a lack of funding, there's severe treatment options, there's a lack of coordinated care between mental health, between primary care providers, uh, and, and uh, other um, types of resources. And there's often uh, bureaucrat bureaucratic changes, a lot of paperwork and wait lists for treatment and so forth that makes it challenging, especially in rural areas, although both urban and rural areas to get uh, appropriate care for substance use problems. Uh, I was lucky enough to work with a really great postdoctoral fellow by the name of Jamie Lister, and he's gone on, he's a PhD social worker, and he's now uh, an assistant professor in social work at Rutgers University in uh, New Jersey. And about a year and a half ago, he published the systematic review, which focused on rural specific barriers to medication uh, treatment for opioid use disorder in the United States. And in this review, he reviewed all of the, the scientific literature on this topic and really identified, I think, a lot of the specific barriers, both at the consumer level and also at the provider level. And they really do cover sort of the same areas, availability, accessibility, and acceptability of treatment. So for example, at the consumer level, consumer focused barriers in terms of availability, often rural areas um, uh, are more likely than urban areas to lack available medication treatment clinics and wavered practitioners. Uh, in terms of accessibility, rural consumers are more likely in urban to have travel hardships, for example, acceptability. Rural consumers uh, offer medication treatments, are, are offered medication treatments less than urban consumers, perhaps due to, due to concerns that treatment wouldn't work for these folks. There are also provider-focused sort of barriers, including rural providers, uh, such as limited capacity and infrastructure, so there's a lack of staff. And I've run into this in terms of work, working with um, providers at recovery houses that often they're running on shoestring budgets, right? With, with relatively few people. There's sometimes a lack of time for rural providers to provide me uh, medication treatment and so forth. Uh, but this has implications for people who operate and people who live in recovery houses. So uh, obviously recovery houses are for people who are newly in recovery. They often provide initial uh, time in, uh, and support to learn how to sustain long-term recovery. And these services are often provided in rural areas where there are these limitations and, and these uh, sort of fewer resources for treatment than are generally uh, seen in, in urban areas. So that's sort of the backdrop. And I think that that provides a bit of a basis for where I'm going to go next, which is to talk a little bit about contingency management and how we've used contingency management as a, a, a treatment intervention in substance use disorder um, care over the years, but also sort of transitioning into how we might be able to use contingency management, not so much as a treatment, but as an intervention in, uh, actually that's provided by uh, recovery house staff in recovery homes. So just very briefly, you know, what is contingency management? It's based on uh, principles of operant conditioning. It's essentially based on principles of reward and punishment. And you guys, if you've all sort of taken introductory psychology in college or, or, or read up on, on these concepts before, you'll know that um, behavior often is sort of learned on the basis of whether or not we're rewarded for the behavior we engage in or punished for the behavior we, we are get engaged in. And obviously punishes, punishments tend to decrease the chance that we're gonna engage in the same behavior again and rewards increase the chance that we're gonna engage in those behaviors again. When we're talking about contingency management, we're usually focused on reinforcement, you know, providing positives to people. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what positives we give people, but um, when we do contingency management, what we generally do is we pick a particular behavior of interest that we're interested in rewarding. And in traditional contingency management treatment, that has usually been providing um, some sort of uh, you know, urine sample or saliva sample or other type of sample that is negative for a substance. So we've done a lot of work in the area of cocaine use disorder, where we focused on providing reinforcement for um, negative urine, co you know, urine drug screens for cocaine. I've done a lot of work in the area of smoking cessation, for example, 
example, we're doing a study right now focused on um, individuals in treatment for HIV who want to quit smoking cigarettes. And if those folks give us negative carbon monoxide samples, they can get rewarded for that and so forth. We pick a particular behavior of interest. We monitor it on a regular basis, provide some sort of tangible reward when that target behavior occurs. And we withhold that reward when the target behavior does not occur. So with the example of say cocaine use disorder, if someone gives us a negative drug screen, they get a chance to win a prize or they get a voucher or they, some other sort of reward. If it comes up positive, then we just let them know that they're, they don't get that reward that day. Um, and of course, you know, in terms of how contingency management works, we have to give the reinforcement frequently. The reward must be sufficiently reinforcing. It has to be fairly sort of strong in terms of its magnitude. The participant needs to be clear on the criteria for the reinforcement. The reinforcement should occur as close in time as possible to the target behavior that we're sort of focused on. So again, let's say someone is trying to quit smoking, we'd want to meet with them fairly frequently, at least weekly, maybe even more frequently. Um, they, the reward that they could get needs to be sufficiently rewarding, like it needs to be of high enough magnitude. Um, and we need to be able to reward them like as soon as we do some sort of test with them. Uh, if we go through, and of course, a few other things, reinforcement, uh, we usually you know, allow it to escalate for consecutive occurrences of the behavior. So it starts sort of low and gets higher over time. Reinforcement should be stopped and possibly reset to the lowest level and behavior is not observed. Different types of uh, contingency management over time have involved things like actually providing money to people, giving them a voucher towards, you know, that they could spend towards something else in the future or, uh, or prize vouchers. We also um, in the past have, done contingency management work where people can get, for example, take home doses if they're in, uh, if they're in methadone based treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, and uh, actually in my, one of my early studies that I was involved in, in the late 1990s, we were providing contingency management for people with um, cocaine use disorder if they provided drug screens that were negative for, for cocaine. And for the first six months, they got vouchers so they could get money to spend with their, their counselor on something that was consistent with their treatment planning. But for the second six months, because we couldn't afford to continue that for like a 12 month period, they would get lottery scratch off tickets. So this was the 1990s, this FYI, I will say the second sort of side of my research experience, my research sort of focus is on gambling disorder. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> that was where I actually learned to become a problem gambling researcher as well. So um, we, we also, of course, in um, token economies back in the, in the 60s and 70s, you know, they also used to use cigarettes to, to encourage positive behavior. Now we know that smoking related illnesses are one of the most preventable, you know, one of the most prevalent preventable causes of death among people with substance use disorder, of course. So there's been quite a lot of research out there focusing primarily on um, the use of contingency management substance use disorder treatment. As I mentioned, we focused a lot on drug-free biochemical tests like uh, urine drug screens, carbon monoxide for smoking, cotinine tests for smoking and so forth. But we've also used it for a few other things, including attending treatment, engaging in treatment related activities, uh, and adherence to medications, for example. The big thing that you know, we really need to sort of um, uh, be able to do when we're providing a reward for changing behavior is verify that the behavior actually occurred, right? So you could see with urine drug screens, that's kind of been the gold standard because we could do a urine test and say, is it positive, is it negative? It's, it eats one or the other. It's a little bit more challenging when we get into engaging in treatment related activities, but this is a lot closer to what we're gonna be doing in the recovery houses. And I'll tell you about that because we're not, we're not providing reinforcement for urine drug screens or that sort of thing. We're doing something a little bit different. Um, it's not working, oh, there we go. So again, um, Oftentimes a participant receives some sort of chance to in, in, in prize reinforcement, which is what we use, a uh, participant receives a chance to win a prize for completing whatever target behavior we've agreed is the focus of the reinforcement. Often we uh, allow them to sort of draw one prize draw at the very beginning and that might go up. So next time the person engages in that target behavior, they might get two draws, then three draws and so, so on up to some maximum five or 10. 
There's often a real reset after failure to complete the target. So that keeps people that so strings of behaviors keep going. And the prize amounts are usually fairly small uh, with most being in kind of like a $1 range, but some being, you know, $20 or a very small number being what we call a jumbo prize or $100. And this is sort of our tools of the trade that we, we have been using over many years. We often have prize cabinets where people can actually get physical prizes um, where they could select prizes from a cabinet. Uh, and uh, oftentimes they'll pick gift certificates to some place because that is you know, something they can use sort of a lot of different places. And we've often had um, sort of these prize fish bowls where people almost like a little raffle where you could draw slips of paper out of the uh, fish bowl, And that's how you get the prizes. And I will say here, this is, this is Jamie Lister who, I, who wrote that paper that I mentioned at the beginning and his wife, Holly, they met in my lab and got married. So to, we are a bit of matchmakers in the lab. Now, I, I will say here, this, this is what we kind of used to use. COVID put a little bit of a kibosh on how we do contingency management. With the prize fishbowl, you don't necessarily want people touching the papers and putting them back and everything, you know. We're a little bit worried about that. So we've actually started creating like virtual prize wheels, like almost like a wheel of fortune type of wheel where you could just spin the wheel and it'll land on a large prize, small prize, so forth. And instead of um, prizes like this, we found that people actually prefer something that they can use anywhere. And we've started using something called a debit, a clinic, clin card debit card, which is a research-based debit card where people can get money put on this debit card and they can use it at the local pharmacy, the local grocery store, and so forth, instead of um, giving them sort of prizes that often people don't want and then get put in storage at our laboratory for a long period of time. Um, but I want to sort of, you know, talk a little bit about implementation, because as I mentioned at the beginning, this is one of the most effective treatment approaches that for many, many years, nobody implemented. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't you know, for a lot of different reasons, sometimes philosophical reasons, you know, you don't want to pay people for abstinence, sometimes for logistical reasons, sort of teaching people how to do an evidence-based treatment and then being able to support it in terms of the, the cost and so forth. But we were actually moving much more in the direction of being able to sort of implement this intervention. I'm not going to go through this slide uh, too, too much, but I will sort of mention that uh, contingency management has actually been implemented on a broad scale through the VA hospitals for substance use disorder and also in, uh, in the New York uh, City area in their treatment programs as well. So it started to be um, introduced into much larger systems. Uh, and it's, of course, as I mentioned, it's been in many uh, sort of well-designed clinical trials, meta-analyses, and so forth. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of the studies that I've been involved in really quickly, and then just talk about our study that we're going to, uh, that we're doing now, actually. The first study was a, a, a project that um, I worked on with Nancy Petrie and Sheila Alessi, and we published this particular study in 2012. And this was the basis for a lot of the implementation work that we've done since that time, the last 10 years. Um, we were working, this is actually one of two studies that we did at the time. And this one was focused on um, clinics providing treatment, medication treatment for opioid use disorder. And in that study, the aims of the study were basically to train community-based clinicians um, on the background and administration of contingency management to provide individual supervision on the administration of, of CM. So we would meet with the clinicians on a regular basis. We would review audio sessions of their um, contingency management work and we would give them feedback and say, hey, you did these things great. You missed this one thing or, or that sort of thing. And then conducted a, a randomized control trial of the efficacy of contingency management, specifically in this study for cocaine abstinence as applied by community-based therapists. And we basically did this in a three-phase process. We did a didactic workshop training. Um, it was a two-day instruction on contingency management. We did role play adherence exercises. 
and the, the clinicians had to pass a test to go to the next level. The second phase was this sort of pilot phase where uh, the clinicians would select one of someone on their caseload and do contingency management with, with like a pilot case or practice case. And we would do fairly intensive clinical supervision over the phone with those, uh, with those clinicians to let them know how they're doing, to get their answer their questions and so forth. And then once they sort of passed phase two, we did this, uh, this clinical trial. Uh, and in this particular study, and again, like I said, we had two, this one was at opioid use disorder clinics. The other one was at drug-free clinics. So it was focused on a broader group of people with substance use problems. Uh, we trained 23 clinicians and 16 of them went on to participate in the, in the clinical trial. Um, we uh, were able to recruit uh, 130 participants who are, uh, who are clients of the various clinics that were involved in the study. Uh, 59 of them went on to the, the usual care group, so they continued to get, uh, and in this case, it was entirely methadone-based treatment plus counseling um, for the entire period of the study. And then 71, 71 participants received usual care plus this contingency management as uh, implemented by the trained clinicians in their, in their clinic. And I'll just show you three graphs really quickly. These are the main outcomes of this particular study. The first graph was uh, retention, number of weeks retained in treatment, and the, the, you know, it's a little bit small. So it goes from zero to 10 weeks here. And what we found was um, in, among the usual care participants, they stayed in treatment just a little bit under seven weeks compared to just about 10 weeks in the contingency management. Group. So we, we see a longer retention of participants in, in the uh, study treatment, the contingency management portion in the contingency management group compared to the, uh, the usual care group. Uh, we also looked at longest duration of continuous abstinence from cocaine in these, uh, in these groups over the course of a 12 week period. And by longest duration of continuous abstinence, that's self-reported abstinence from cocaine uh, verified by twice weekly urine drug screens. So they went through drug, urine drug screens twice a week for that 12 week period. And what we found was that the longest duration of abstinence for those who are in the usual care group was just under two weeks compared to just about five weeks for the contingency management group over 12, out of 12 weeks on average. Uh, and the third graph, because you, you might say, you might sort of look at these, uh, the first two graphs and say, well, of course, this group's going to have a longer duration of continuous abstinence because they also stayed in treatment longer. You're able to verify how they did. We also looked at uh, abstinence as a proportion of um, drug screens. So the percentage of the drug screens that participants uh, actually provided that were negative for cocaine. And what we found was in the usual care group, about 30% of the drug screens were were negative for cocaine compared to just about 60% of those in the contingency management condition. So what we're seeing here is that um, not only does contingency management work, which we kind of already knew, but it works when it's actually implemented by uh, community-based clinicians, right? People in the community who are trained, go through, you know, not that long of a training, a couple of days have some uh, backup in terms of clinical supervision uh, and, um, uh, and then, and then, sort of uh, uh, do this work over the course of a couple of years. I should also mention because it took a couple of years to complete the cl clinical trial. Once we got to that point, so uh, contingency management participants earned, on average, just under seventy-three draws during a twelve their twelve-week treatment periods. The average overall reinforcement cost was about one hundred and sixty dollars per individual in the contingency management condition. There were no significant follow-up differences in the nine-month follow-up. So treatment effectiveness did drop off once the contingencies were removed. Uh, unfortunately, that's true of most, most treatments. And the therapists also maintained very good to excellent fidelity in the contingency management over the course of the study. So we actually had them audio record most of their uh, treatment sessions and, um, it, and they did an excellent job. And we've actually repeated this right now. I'm doing some work. Uh, we're doing something very similar with um, uh, clinical pharmacists who treat individuals with HIV who are quitting smoking, and we're doing s similar stuff there. Five minutes, okay, great. Um, I'm going to sort of zip past this other one. I'll just say 
This additional study, we did a second study that was actually uh, a very brief study where we did another sort of different type of contingency management for treatment attendance. And we found, oops, that we got similar results in terms of contingency management. Contingency management actually increased the rate of uh, attendance to group therapy. So I know I'm running a little bit low on time. I'm gonna skip ahead to the reason I'm here, <laughs> which is our rural recovery house study that we're hoping to, uh, we're doing now, and we're hoping to recruit more houses for. Um, but we're doing something very similar. The aim is to train uh, individuals in rural recovery houses who work in rural recovery houses to implement similar contingency management interventions and to also the, assess the effectiveness of contingency management for increasing retention in recovery houses and also engagement in recovery-oriented activities. So in this particular study, I'll sort of just broadly go over the, the aims. We want to recruit 120 uh, residents in recovery houses and about 20 or so staff members in recovery houses. And so we figure this will take about 10 to 12 recovery houses to probably get the, the participants that we want for this particular study. All right. And um, so each house, we're going to basically flip a coin, we get two houses that are similar, flip a coin. One house will receive the contingency management and the other house will be a usual care house. So they would provide this, the services that they normally would. Um, the, the house that gets the contingency management would provide the usual care that they usually provide plus the contingency management. And uh, participants in the study will undergo assessments at baseline just after the 12 week intervention and at six months. Um, and um, they'll meet weekly with a recovery house staff member and those receiving contingency management will meet um, with the staff member and come up with three recovery related activities that they'll do in the following week. And that's gonna be the target for the intervention, the target for the, uh, for the incentive. Participants will then sort of go through the week, they'll do that intervention or they'll, they'll do those target behaviors and they'll uh, come back, get some, you know, they'll verify it with their uh, staff member and then they will get this opportunity to pr draw prizes for completing those activities. And again, prize draws are similar to what I talked about before. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, in most previous studies, we've been able to provide uh, incentives that are a little bit higher magnitude. But at this point, uh, HRSA and SAMHSA and other organizations, federal organizations, limit us to a maximum of $75 in incentives. Hopefully that'll change over time. Um, but basically, uh, what we're hoping to do is get the recovery house staff members who want to be involved in the study to go through a similar training to what I described in the previous study. So they would go through a one day training. Um, we would do some uh, didactic lectures, we'll do some role plays as well as quizzes. And we would also ask staff to record their sessions for supervision purposes, just like the previous uh, study that I mentioned to you. And just a couple more slides, let me get this to work. What we're interested in looking at is just how effective the contingency management is at um, in, improving treatment retention. So getting people to stay in treatment or in recovery house retention, getting people to stay in the recovery house a little bit longer and seeing if it actually helps to get people to be more engaged in uh, recovery oriented activities. So I'm gonna stop there. I'd just like to uh, thank uh, a lot of people, including folks at the uh, Fletcher group, including Dave and uh, Milena and uh, open it up for questions if I still have any time. <laughs> are two minutes left so we can take one question but before we take the question um if you want to enroll in the study please see dave and i after this session we did chat my email into the chat for our online audience to connect with me as well uh, to participate in the study um, so we might have room for one question <laughs> and i'm gonna have you do it on the microphone so our audience online can hear Okay, well, it's a really tough one because you said the long term there was, you know, not a significant difference at the nine months. So why do we invest in the first six if there's no change at the nine? So that's a really good question. And this is a question that's been asked, uh, not just in the contingency management literature, but in 
in treatment literature across across the board. Um, one one answer I can give you is that one study is not indicative of all of the studies on contingency management. It has been a mix. Some studies have found that there are long-term benefits to contingency management. Uh, the other thing I will say is that all of the other forms of treatment that I've ever studied, including motivational interviewing, CBT, medications, uh, all of those have the same problem. <laughs> Sadly, um, you know, when you remove the treatment, and we know that uh, addiction is a chronically relapsing, chronically, you know, occurring sort of illness, and that people often go through multiple uh, treatment episodes before they finally reach a point where they can go into longer term recovery. So I wouldn't, you know, I've, that's been my the way I've sort of rationalized it in my own head for many years. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. If there's time. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about, um, given what we know about recovery housing, you know, the supportive environment it provides, people are there, if they, you know, enter the house, they're living there. And so I'm just curious, um, your thoughts on, um, do you kind of suspect or hypothesize that CM may work better for those people than folks in the past with other studies you've done where they, you know, those individuals and the other trials weren't in an environment where others are engaged in CM. So that kind of that camaraderie, camaraderie or alliance where they're all working together and, you know, participating in the CM experiment. Um, so one study that I had up on there that I didn't have time to really go through was actually a, a treatment group therapy treatment study that occurred um, in drug-free clinics where um, the contingency management itself was done in a group format, actually. And um, so other folks in the group could see somebody earning prizes or winning prizes. And um, that I had an opportunity personally, this was in New Haven, Connecticut, a uh, couple, you know, about a decade and a half ago, but uh, I had an opportunity to sit in on some of those groups. It was crazy, actually. People were really, really excited about it. I didn't, I always thought of it more clinically, like sort of, you know, seeing people do CM individually, but when you actually see people earning incentives, there's a modeling effect, right? That happens in addition to the actual individual reinforcement effect, which I think is kind of cool. So I think, does that answer your question? Okay, cool, good. Cool. I can just say anecdotally, um, we have a 60 day residential treatment center and we've been doing contingency management for about five years. And um, in their one group that they do once mm -hmm. a week, they can earn collectively prizes if all of the group does things. But then individually, I can earn a sleep in card, I can yeah. earn you know, prizes, I can earn gift cards. And it's amazing how motivating it is to the other people of, I want you to be successful um, to do what you need to do. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And we're actually trying to do some clinical research to look at team contingency management where people in the team have to engage in the activities together. In addition to individual reinforcement that people have to, everybody in the team has to contribute something to get the reinforcement, which would be cool too. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Ledgerwood um, for your presentation. One more quick ask from the audience. We are also doing a survey of recovery houses to understand your attitudes and beliefs about recovery housing and contingency management. I have a QR code and I also have a link and we're offering a $5 incentive for the survey and would love for residents to take it. So please come see me at the end of the session if you're interested in that. And thank you for being here. <laughs>